call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen, regulating the circulation. There now is your insular city of the Manhattos, belted round by wharves as Indian isles by coral reefs. Commerce surrounds it with her surf. Right and left, the streets take you waterward. Look at the crowds of water-gazers there. Now why is almost every robust, healthy boy with a robust, healthy soul in him at some time or other crazy to go to sea? Why did the old Persians hold the sea holy? Surely all this is not without meaning. And still deeper is the meaning of that story of Narcissus, who, because he could not grasp the tormenting, mild image he saw in the fountain, plunged into it and was drowned. But that same image we ourselves see in all rivers and oceans. It is the image of the ungraspable phantom of life. And this is the key to it all. Now when I say that I am in the habit of going to sea whenever I begin to grow hazy about the eyes and begin to be overconscious of my lungs, I do not mean to have it inferred that I ever go to sea as a passenger. No, I never go as a passenger. No, when I go to sea, I go as a simple sailor, right before the mast. Plumb down into the forecastle, aloft there to the royal masthead. True, they rather order me about some and make me jump from spar to spar like a grasshopper in a May meadow. But what of it if some old hunks of a sea captain orders me to get a broom and sweep down the decks? What does that indignity amount to, weighed, I mean, in the scales of the New Testament? Who ain't a slave? Tell me that. Again, I always go to sea as a sailor because they make a point of paying me for my trouble whereas they never pay passengers a single penny that I ever heard of. Finally, I always go to sea as a sailor because of the wholesome exercise and pure air of the forecastle deck, but wherefore it was that after having repeatedly smelt the sea as a merchant sailor, I should now take it into my head to go on a whaling voyage. <laughs> this, the invisible police officer of the fates, who has the constant surveillance of me, and secretly dogs me, and influences me in some unaccountable way, he can better answer than anyone else. Chief among my conscious motives was the overwhelming idea of the great whale himself. Such a portentous and mysterious monster roused all my curiosity. Then the wild and distant seas where he rolled his island bulk, the undeliverable nameless perils of the whale, these, with all the attending marvels of a thousand Patagonian sights and sounds, helped to sway me to my wish. By reason of these things, then, the whaling voyage was welcome. The great floodgates of the wonder world swung open, and there floated into my inmost soul endless processions of the whale, and, midmost of them all, one grand hooded phantom, like a snow hill in the air. I stuffed a shirt or two into my old carpet bag, tucked it under my arm, and started for Cape Horn in the Pacific. Quitting the good city of old Manhattan, I had duly arrived in New Bedford. It was on a Saturday night in December. Much was I disappointed upon learning that the little packet for Nantucket had already sailed, and that no way of reaching that place would offer till the following Monday. As most young candidates for the pains and penalties of whaling stop at this same New Bedford, thence to embark on their voyage, it may as well be related that I, for one, had no idea of doing so, for my mind was made up to sail in none other than a Nantucket craft because there was a fine, boisterous something about everything connected with that famous old island, which amazingly pleased me. Now, having a night, a day, and still another night following before me in New Bedford, ere I could embark for my destined port, it became a matter of concernment where I was to eat and sleep meanwhile. By instinct, I followed the streets that took me waterward, for there doubtless were the cheapest, if not the cheeriest inns. Moving on, I at last came to a dim sort of light not far from the dock, and heard a forlorn creaking in the air, and looking up, saw a swinging sign over the door with a white painting upon it, faintly representing a tall, straight jet of misty spray, and these words underneath. The Spouter Inn. Peter Coffin. Coffin? Spouter? <laughs> Rather ominous in that particular connection, thought I. But it is a common name in Nantucket, they say, and I suppose this Peter here is an emigrant from there. It was a queer sort of place. A gable-ended old house, one side palsied, as it were, leaning over sadly. It stood on a sharp, bleak corner. But no more of this blubbering now. We're going a-wailing. 
and there is plenty of that yet to come. Entering that gable-ended spouter inn, you found yourself in a wide, low, straggling entry with old-fashioned wainscots, reminding one of the bulwarks of some condemned old craft. The opposite wall of this entry was hung all over with a heathenish array of monstrous clubs and spears. You shuddered as you gazed and wondered what monstrous cannibal and savage could ever have gone a death harvesting with such hacking, horrifying implements. Mixed with these were rusty old whaling lances and harpoons, all broken and deformed. Crossing this dusky entry and on through yon low-arched way, cut through what in old times must have been a great central chimney with fireplaces all round, you enter the public room. Projecting from the further angle of the room stands a dark-looking den, the bar, a rude attempt at a right whale's head. Upon entering the place, I found a number of young seamen gathered about a table, Examining by a dim light diverse specimens of scrimshander, I sought the landlord, and telling him I desired to be accommodated with a room, received for answer that his house was full, not a bed unoccupied. But a vast, he added, tapping his forehead. You ain't no objections to sharing a harpooner's blanket, have ye? I suppose you're going a-whaling, so you better get used to that sort of thing. I told him that I never liked to sleep two in a bed, but if the harpooner was not decidedly objectionable... Why, rather than wander further about a strange town on so bitter a night, I would put up with the half of any decent man's blanket. I thought so. All right, take a seat. Supper? You want supper? Supper will be ready directly. I sat down on an old wooden settle, carved all over like a bench on the battery, and waited. Supper over, the company went back to the bar room, where, knowing not what else to do with myself, I resolved to spend the rest of the evening as a looker-on. No man prefers to sleep two in a bed. In fact, you would a good deal rather not sleep with your own brother. I don't know how it is, but people like to be private when they are sleeping. And the more I pondered over this harpooner, the more I abominated the thought of sleeping with him. The devil fetched that harpooner, thought I. But stop, couldn't I steal a march on him? Bolt his door inside and jump into his bed, not to be wakened by the most violent knockings? It seemed no bad idea. But upon second thoughts I dismissed it. For who could tell but what the next morning, so soon as I popped out of the room, the harpooner might be standing in the entry, all ready to knock me down. Landlord, said I, what sort of chap is he? Does he always keep such late hours? It was now hard upon twelve o'clock. The landlord chuckled again, with his lean chuckle, and seemed to be mightily tickled at something beyond my comprehension. No, he answered. Generally he's an early bird. But tonight he went out a-peddling, you see. And maybe he can't sell his head. Can't sell his head? What sort of bamboozingly story is this? Getting into a towering rage. Do you pretend to say, landlord, that this harpooner is actually engaged this blessed Saturday night, or rather Sunday morning, in peddling his head around this town? That's precisely it, said the landlord. And I told him he couldn't sell it here. The market's overstocked. With what? shouted I. With heads, to be sure. Ain't there too many heads in the world? I tell you what it is, landlord, said I quite calmly. You'd better stop spinning that yarn to me. I'm not green. Maybe not, taking out a stick and whittling a toothpick. But I rather guess you'll be done brown if that ere arpooner hears you a slander in his head. I'll break it for him, said I, now flying into a passion again at this unaccountable farrago of the landlord's. It's broke already said he. Broke, said I. Broke, do you mean? Sartin. And that's the very reason he can't sell it, I guess. Landlord, said I, going up to him as cool as Mount Hecla in a snowstorm. Landlord, stop whittling. You and I must understand one another, and that too without delay. Be easy, be easy. This here harpooner I've been telling you of has just arrived from the South Seas, where he bought up a lot of bomb New Zealand heads. Great curios, you know. And he sold all of them but one. And that one he's trying to sell tonight, because tomorrow's Sunday. And it would not do to be selling human heads about the streets when folks is going to churches. Depend upon it, landlord. That harpooner is a dangerous man. He pays regular, was the rejoinder. But come, it's getting dreadful late. You had better be turning flukes. It's a nice bed. Sal and me slept in that ere bed the night we was spliced. There's plenty of room for two to kick about in that bed. It's an almighty big bed, that. I considered the matter a moment, and then upstairs we went, 
and I was ushered into a small room, cold as a clam, and furnished, sure enough, with a prodigious bed, almost big enough indeed for any four harpooners to sleep abreast. There, said the landlord, and I turned round from eyeing the bed, but he had disappeared. I sat down on the side of the bed and commenced thinking about this head-peddling harpooner. After thinking some time on the bedside, I made no more ado, but jumped out of my monkey jacket, coat, pantaloons, and boots, and then blowing out the light, tumbled into bed, commended myself to the care of heaven. At last I slid off into a light doze, when I heard a heavy footfall in the passage, and saw a glimmer of light come into the room from under the door. Lord save me, thinks I, that must be the harpooner the infernal head peddler, but I lay perfectly still and resolved not to say a word till spoken to. Holding a light in one hand and that identical New Zealand head in the other, the stranger entered the room and began working away at the knotted cords of a large bag secreted in the room away from my previous gaze. I was all eagerness to see his face, but he kept it averted. Suddenly, however, he turned round. When, good heavens, what a sight! Such a face! It was of a dark purplish-yellow color, here and there stuck over with large blackish-looking squares. Yes, it's just as I thought. He's a terrible bedfellow. He's been in a fight. Now, while these ideas were passing through me like lightning, this harpooner never noticed me at all. But after some difficulty, having opened his bag, he commenced fumbling in it, and presently pulled out a sort of tomahawk and a sealskin wallet with the hair on. Placing these on an old chest in the middle of the room, he then took the New Zealand head, ghastly thing enough, and crammed it down into his bag. He now took off his hat, when I came nigh singing out with fresh surprise. His bald, purplish head now looked for all the world like a mildewed skull. Had not the stranger stood between me and the door, I would have bolted out of it quicker than ever I bolted at dinner. Meanwhile, he continued the business of undressing, and at last showed his chest and arms. As I live, these covered parts of him were checkered with the same squares as his face. It was now quite plain that he must be some abominable savage. But there was no time for shuddering, for now the savage went about something that completely fascinated my attention and convinced me that he must indeed be a heathen. Going to his heavy rapper, which he had previously hung on a chair, he fumbled in the pocket and produced at length the curious little deformed image with a hunch on its back and exactly the color of a three-days-old Congo baby. Remembering the embalmed head, at first I almost thought that this black mannequin was a real baby, preserved in some similar manner. But seeing that it was not at all limber, and that it glistened a good deal like polished ebony, I concluded that it must be nothing but a wooden idol, which indeed it proved to be. For now the savage goes up to the empty fireplace, and removing the papered fireboard, sets up this little hunchbacked image like a tenpin between the andirons, and begins a savage rite with a ship's biscuit and a small fire. I thought it was high time, now or never, before the light was put out, to break the spell in which I had so long been bound. But the interval I spent in deliberating what to say was a fatal. Taking up his tomahawk from the table, he examined the head of it for an instant, and then holding it to the light, with his mouth at the handle, he puffed out great clouds of tobacco smoke. The next moment the light was extinguished. And this wild cannibal, tomahawk between his teeth, sprang into bed with me. I sang out. I could not help it now. And giving a sudden grunt of astonishment, he began feeling me. Stammering out something, I knew not what, I rolled away from him against the wall, and then conjured him to keep quiet and let me light the lamp again. But his guttural responses satisfied me at once that he but ill comprehended my meaning. Oi, devil you! he at last said. You no speaky. Damn me, I kill he. And so saying, the lighted tomahawk began flourishing about me in the dark. Landlord, for God's sake, Peter Coffin, shouted I. Landlord, watch, Coffin, angel, save me. Don't be afraid now, said the landlord, coming into my room. Queequeg here wouldn't harm a hair of your head. Stop your grinning, shouted I. And why didn't you tell me that that infernal harpooner was a cannibal? I thought you knowed it. Didn't I tell you? He was peddling heads around town. Queequeg, look here. You sabby me, I sabby you. This man sleepy you. You sabby? Me sabby plenty, grunted Queequeg, puffing away at his pipe and sitting up in bed. You get the in, he added, motioning to me with his tomahawk 
and throwing the clothes to one side. He really did this in not only a civil, but a really kind and charitable way. Landlord, said I, tell him to stash his tomahawk there, or pipe, or whatever you call it. Tell him to stop smoking, in short, and I will turn in with him. But I don't fancy having a man smoking in bed with me. It's dangerous. Besides, I ain't insured. This being told to Queequeg, he at once complied, and again politely motioned me to get into bed, rolling over to one side as much as to say, I won't touch a leg of you. Good night, landlord, I said. You may go. I turned in and never slept better in my life. Upon waking next morning about daylight, I found Queequeg's arm thrown over me in a most loving and affectionate manner. You had almost thought that I'd been his wife. I then rolled over, my neck feeling as if it were in a horse collar, and suddenly felt a slight scratch. Throwing aside the counterpane, there lay the tomahawk. Queequeg, in the name of goodness, Queequeg, wake! At length, by dint of much wriggling, I succeeded in extracting a grunt, and presently he drew back his arm, shook himself all over, and sat up in bed, looking at me, and rubbing his eyes, as if he did not altogether remember how I came to be there. When at last his mind seemed made up, touching the character of his bedfellow, he jumped out upon the floor, and by certain signs and sounds gave me to understand that, if it pleased me, he would dress first. Thinks I, Queequeg, under the circumstances, this is a very civilized overture. His toilet was soon achieved, and he proudly marched out of the room. I quickly followed suit, and descending into the bar room, accosted the grinning landlord very pleasantly. I cherished no malice towards him, though he had been skylocking with me not a little in the matter of my bedfellow. If I had been astonished at first catching a glimpse of so outlandish an individual as Queequeg circulating among the polite society of a civilized town, that astonishment soon departed upon taking my first daylight stroll through the streets of New Bedford. In thoroughfares nigh the docks, any considerable seaport will frequently offer to view the queerest-looking nondescripts from foreign parts. But there weekly arrive in this town also scores of green Vermonters and New Hampshire men, all athirst for gain and glory in the fishery. And yet nowhere in all America will you find more patrician-like houses, parks and gardens more opulent than in New Bedford. In the same New Bedford, there stands a whaleman's chapel, and few are the moody fishermen who fail to make a Sunday visit to the spot. I chose to make my attempt, and shaking off the sleet from my ice-glazed hat and jacket, I seated myself near the door. I had not been seated very long ere a man of a certain venerable robustness entered and climbed to the pulpit. Yes, it was the famous Father Mapple, so called by the whalemen, among whom he was a very great favorite. In a mild voice of unassuming authority, he told us all the tale of Jonah and how his sin had led him to be eaten whole by the whale, a cautionary tale for a whaling people, and I left with not a little contemplation. Returning to the spouter inn from the chapel, I found Queequeg there, holding close up to his face that little negro idol of his, peering hard into its face. But being now interrupted, he put up the image, and pretty soon, going to the table, took up a large book there and placing it on his lap began counting the pages with deliberate regularity and showing increasing amazement. With much interest I sat watching him. Savage though he was, and hideously marred about the face, at least to my taste, his countenance yet had a something in it which was by no means disagreeable. You cannot hide the soul. As I sat there in that now lonely room, the fire burning low, I began to be sensible of strange feelings. I felt a melting in me. I drew my bench near him, and made some friendly signs and hints, doing my best to talk with him meanwhile. At first he little noticed these advances, whereat I thought he looked pleased, perhaps a little compliment. We then turned over the book together, and I endeavored to explain to him the purpose of the printing, and the meaning of the few pictures that were in it. Soon I proposed a social smoke as well, and producing his pouch and tomahawk, he quietly offered me a puff. And then we sat exchanging puffs from that wild pipe of his and keeping it regularly passing between us. After a supper, we went to our room together again, and he made me a present of his embalmed head, took out his enormous tobacco wallet, and groping under the tobacco, drew out some thirty dollars in silver. Then spreading them on the table and mechanically dividing them into two equal portions, pushed one of them towards me and said it was mine. 
I was going to remonstrate, but he silenced me by pouring them into my trouser pockets. He then went about his evening prayers, taking out his idol and removing the paper firebrand. Now, I was a good Christian, but what is worship? Queequeg is my fellow man. Consequently, I must then unite with him in this. So I kindled the shavings, helped prop up the innocent little idol, salaamed before him twice or thrice, kissed his nose, and that done, we undressed and went to bed. But we did not go to sleep without some little chat. How it is, I know not, but there is no place like a bed for confidential disclosures between friends. Yet this made us very wakeful, and I did not at all object to the hint from Queequeg that perhaps it were best to strike a light, as he felt a strong desire to have a few quiet puffs from his tomahawk. With our shaggy jackets drawn about our shoulders, we now passed the tomahawk from one to the other, and he told me his tale of his savage but happy life before adulthood. At the completion of this, which took many hours, I asked him what might be his immediate purpose. He answered to go to sea again. Upon this, I told him that whaling was my own design, and he at once resolved to accompany me aboard the same vessel, get into the same watch, the same boat, the same mess with me, in short, to share my every hat. To all this, I joyously assented. His story being ended with his pipe's last dying puff, Queequeg embraced me, and blowing out the light, we rolled over from each other, this way and that, and very soon were sleeping. Next morning, Monday, after disposing of the embalmed head to a barber for a block, I settled my own and comrade's bill, using, however, my comrade's money. We borrowed a wheelbarrow, and, embarking our things, including my own poor carpet bag and Queequeg's canvas sack and hammock, away we went down to the moss, the little Nantucket packet schooner moored at the wharf. At last, passage paid and luggage safe, we stood on board the schooner, hoisting sail, it glided down the Akushnet River. On one side, New Bedford rose in terraces of streets, their ice-covered trees all glittering in the clear, cold air. Gaining the more open water, the bracing breeze waxed fresh and turned me to admire the magnanimity of the sea, which will permit no record. At the same foam fountain, Queequeg seemed to drink and reel with me. His dusky nostrils swelled apart. He showed his filed and pointed teeth. On, on we flew. Nothing happened on the passage worthy of mentioning, so, just to say, after a fine run, we safely arrived in Nantucket. Nantucket. Take out your map and look at it. See what a real corner of the world it occupies. Look at it. A mere hillock, an elbow of sand, all beach without a background. What wonder, then, that these Nantucketers, born on a beach, should take to the sea for a livelihood. They first caught crabs and quahogs in the sand, and at last, put a navy of great ships on the sea. It was quite late in the evening when the little moss came snugly to anchor and Queequeg and I went ashore. The landlord of the Spouter Inn had recommended us to his cousin Hosea Hussey of the Tripots, whom he asserted to be the proprietor of one of the best-kept hotels in all Nantucket. And moreover, he had assured us that cousin Hosea, as he called him, was famous for his chowders. Fishiest of all fishy places was the Tripots which well deserved its name, for the pots there were always boiling chowder. Chowder for breakfast, and chowder for dinner, and chowder for supper. Supper for our first night concluded, we received a lamp and made our way to bed. In bed we concocted our plans for the morrow, but to my surprise and no small concern, Queequeg now gave me to understand that he had been diligently consulting Yojo, the name of his little black god, and Yojo had told him two or three times over, that instead of our going together among the whaling fleet in harbor, Yojo earnestly enjoined that the selection of the ship should rest wholly with me, and in order to do so, had already pitched upon a vessel, which, if left to myself, I, Ishmael, should infallibly light upon, and in that vessel I must immediately ship myself, for the present, irrespective of Queequeg. Now this plan of Queequeg's, or then Yojo's, touching the selection of our craft, I did not like that plan at all. But as all my remonstrances produced no effect upon Queequeg, I was obliged to acquiesce. Next morning early, leaving Queequeg shut up with Yojo in our little bedroom, for it seemed that it was some sort of Lent or Ramadan, or day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer with Queequeg and Yojo that day, I sallied out among the shipping. 
After much prolonged sauntering and many random inquiries, I learnt that there were three ships up for three years' voyages, the Devil Dam, the Titbit, and the Pequod. Finally, going on board this latter ship, I looked around her for a moment, and then decided that this was the very ship for us. You may have seen many a quaint craft in your day, for aught I know. Take my word for it, you never saw such a rare old craft as this same rare old Pequod. Her masts, cut somewhere on the coast of Japan, stood stiffly up like the spines of the three old kings of Cologne. Her ancient decks were worn and wrinkled, but to all these her old antiquities were added new and marvellous features. All round her unpanelled open bulwarks were garnished like one continuous jaw, with the long sharp teeth of the sperm whale. Scorning a turnstile wheel at her reverend helm, she sported there a tiller, and that tiller was in one mass, curiously carved from the long, narrow lower jaw of her hereditary foe. Now when I looked about the quarter-deck for someone having authority, in order to propose myself as a candidate for the voyage, at first I saw nobody, but I could not well overlook a strange sort of tent pitched a little behind the mainmast, and half concealed in this queer tenement, I at length found one who by his aspect seemed to have authority. There was nothing so very particular, perhaps, about the appearance of the elderly man I saw. He was brown and brawny, like most old seamen, and heavily rolled up in blue pilot cloth cut in the Quaker style. But his approach was rare. Is this the captain of the Pequod, said I, advancing to the door of the tent? Supposing it be a captain of the Pequod, what dost thou want of him? he demanded. I was thinking of shipping. Thou wast, wast thou? Ever been in a stove boat? No, sir, I never have. Dost know nothing at all about whaling, I dare say. Nothing, sir, but I have no doubt I shall soon learn. I've been several voyages in the merchant service. Merchant service be damned. Just see that leg? I'll take that leg away from thy stern if ever thou talkest of the merchant service to me again. But flukes, man, what makes thee want to go whaling, eh? Hast not been a pirate, hast thou? I protested my innocence. But what takes thee a whaling? I want to know that now. Well, sir, I want to see what whaling is. I want to see the world. Want to see what whaling is, eh? Have you clapped eye on Captain Ahab? Who is Captain Ahab, sir? Aye, aye, I thought so. Captain Ahab is the captain of this ship. I'm mistaken, then. I thought I was speaking to the captain himself. Thou art speaking to Captain Peleg. It belongs to me and Captain Bildad to see the Pequod fitted out for the voyage and supplied with all her needs. We are part owners and agents. But if thou wantest to know what whaling is, clap eye on Captain Ahab, young man, and thou wilt find that he has only one leg. What do you mean, sir? Was the other one lost by a whale? Lost by a whale, young man? It was devoured, chewed up. I was a little alarmed by his energy but said as calmly as I could, What you say is no doubt true enough, sir. Nay, it's true. But let us understand each other. I have given thee a hint about what whaling is. Do you feel inclined for it? I do, sir. Very good. Now then, thou not only wantest to go a-whaling to find out by experience what whaling is, but you also want to go in order to see the world. Well then, just step forward there and take a peep over the weather bow and then back to me, and tell me what she see there. For a moment I stood a little puzzled by this curious request. But concentrating all his crow's feet into one scowl, Captain Peleg started me on the errand. Well, what's the report? said Peleg when I came back. What did you see? Not much, I replied. Nothing but water. Considerable horizon, though. And there's a squall coming up, I think. Well, what dost thou think, then, of seeing the world? Do you wish to go around Cape Horn to see any more of it, eh? Can't you see the world where you stand? I was a little staggered. But go a-whaling I must, and I would. And the Pequod was as good a ship as any. I thought the best. And all this I now repeated to Peleg. Seeing me so determined, he conceded and expressed his willingness to ship me. And after discussions with his fellow owner, they agreed a fee for my shipping, which, as is the habit, came in the form of a share or lay of profit. Captain Peleg, said I, I have a friend with me who wants to ship too. Shall I bring him down tomorrow? Has he ever whaled at any? Kill more whales than I can count, Captain Peleg. Well, bring him along then. And after signing the papers, off I went. 
But I had not proceeded far when I began to bethink me that the captain with whom I was to sail yet remained unseen by me. Turning back, therefore, I accosted Captain Peleg, inquiring where Captain Ahab was to be found. And what dost thou want of Captain Ahab? It's all right enough. Thou art shipped. Yes, but I should like to see him. But I don't think thou wilt be able to at present. I don't know exactly what's the matter with him, but he keeps close inside the house, sort of sick. He's a queer man, Captain Ahab, so some think, but a good one. Oh, thou like him well enough. No fear, no fear. He's a grand, ungodly, godlike man, Captain Ahab. He's Ahab, boy. And Ahab of old, thou knowest, was a crowned king. And a very vile one. When that wicked king was slain, the dogs, did they not lick his blood? Come hither to me, hither, hither, said Peleg, with a significance in his eye that almost startled me. Look, ye lad, never say that on board the Pequod. Never say it anywhere. He is a good man, not a pious good man like Bildad but a swearing good man. And let me tell you and assure thee, young man, it's better to sail with a moody good captain than a laughing bad one. So, goodbye to thee, and wrong not Captain Ahab, because he happens to have a wicked name. As I walked away, I was full of thoughtfulness. What had been incidentally revealed to me of Captain Ahab filled me with a certain wild vagueness of painfulness concerning him. However, my thoughts were at length carried in other directions, so that for the present, Dark Ahab slipped my mind. As Queequeg's Ramadan, or fasting and humiliation, was to continue all day, I did not choose to disturb him till towards nightfall. But even then he would not move an inch from his meditation, despite the best efforts of the landlady and I. Despairing of him, therefore, I determined to go to bed and to sleep. But previous to turning in, I took my heavy bearskin jacket and threw it over him, as it promised to be a very cold night, and he had nothing but his ordinary round jacket. The following day, Queequeg awoken from his prayers, who set off for the ship, and despite some concern regarding the employment of a cannibal, when Queequeg showed his skills with a harpoon, he was readily engaged with a three-hundredth lay, a very good share. Queequeg and I had just left the Pequod, and were sauntering away from the water, when a strange, pox-marked and shabbily-dressed figure approached us, and suddenly said, Shipmate, have you shipped in that ship? Yes, I replied, staring in disgust at the man. Stop, cried the stranger. You haven't seen Old Thunder, then. Who's Old Thunder? said I, riveted by his manner. Captain Ahab. What, the captain of our ship, the Pequod? I? No, we haven't. He's sick, they say, and will be right again before long. All right again before long, laughed the stranger. He's shipped, have you? Oh, well, what sign to sign? Morning to you. And with that he began to move off. But stop, I cried. What is this? What is your name? Elijah is my name. And with that, he left. Elijah, thought I, and we walked away disturbed by his references to Captain Ahab, but agreeing that he was nothing but a humbug, trying to be a bugbear. A day or two passed, and there was great activity aboard the Pequod. On the day following Queequeg's signing articles, word was given that all chests must be on board, and on the third day after, the assembled crew began to move about their tasks. But of Captain Ahab, they said only that he was in the cabin. At last the anchor was up, the sails were set, and off we glided. It was by this time Christmas, a short, cold Christmas, and as our short northern day merged into night, we found ourselves almost broad upon the wintry ocean. At last, Captains Bildad and Peleg, who were acting as pilots, were no longer needed. Loath to depart, for they had invested much in this ship and loved its timbers, they eventually dropped into their boat, Screaming gull flew overhead. The two hulls wildly rolled, and we blindly plunged like fate into the lone Atlantic. The chief mate of the Pequod was Starbuck, a native of Nantucket, and a Quaker by descent. He was a long, earnest man, and though born on an icy coast, seemed well adapted to endure hot latitudes, his flesh being hard as twice-baked biscuit. A staid, steadfast man, whose life for the most part was a telling pantomime of action, and not a tame chapter of sounds. Starbuck was no crusader after perils. In him courage was not a sentiment, but a thing of use. For, thought Starbuck, I am here in this critical ocean to kill whales for my living, and not to be killed by them for theirs. Stubb was the second mate. He was a native of Cape Cod. A happy-go-lucky, neither craven nor valiant, taking perils as they come with an indifferent air, 
cheerfully trudging off with the burden of life in a world full of grave peddlers. The third mate was Flask, a native of Tisbury in Martha's Vineyard, a short, stout, ruddy young fellow, very pugnacious concerning whales, who somehow seemed to think that the great leviathans had personally and hereditarily affronted him. Utterly lost was he to all sense of reverence for the many marvels of their majestic bulk and mystic ways. These men, then, were momentous men commanding three of the Pequod's boats as headsmen. In that grand order of battle in which Captain Ahab would probably marshal his forces to descend on the whales, these three headsmen were as captains of companies, and like a Gothic knight of old, each is accompanied by a boat steerer or harpooner who provides him with a fresh lance or harpoon when the former is bent or destroyed. First was Queequeg, whom Starbuck had selected as his chief squire. Next was Tashtego an unmixed Indian from Gay Head on Martha's Vineyard, with long, lean sable hair and high cheekbones, who had been chosen by Stubb. And third was Dagu, a gigantic, coal-black negro savage with golden hoops hanging from his ears, who was the squire of Little Flask, who looked just like a chessman beside him. For several days after leaving Nantucket, nothing above the hatches was seen of Captain Ahab. The mates regularly relieved each other at the watches, and they seemed to be the only commanders of the ship. Every time I ascended to the deck from my watches below, I instantly gazed aft to mark if any strange face were visible, for my first disquietude concerning the unknown captain, now in the seclusion of the sea, became a perturbation. This was strangely heightened by recollections of the ragged Elijah. But by every degree and minute of latitude we sailed, we were gradually leaving behind the miserable winter. And it was on a gray and gloomy day, but with a fair wind blowing, that I leveled my glance towards the taffrail, and foreboding shivers ran over me. Reality outran apprehension. Captain Ahab stood upon his quarter-deck. There seemed no sign of common bodily illness about him, nor of the recovery from any. He looked like a man cut away from the stake. His whole high, broad form seemed made of solid bronze and shaped in an unalterable form, like Cellini's cast Perseus threading its way out from among his gray hairs and continuing right down one side of his tawny, scorched face and neck till it disappeared in his clothing. You saw a slender, rod-like mark, lividly whitish. Whether this was born with him, or whether it was a scar left by some desperate wound, no one could or would say. So powerfully did the whole grim aspect of Ahab affect me, and the livid brand which streaked it, that for the first few moments I hardly noted that not a little of this overbearing grimness was owing to the barbaric white leg upon which he partly stood. It now came to me that I had previously been told that this ivory leg had its sea been fashioned from the polished bone of the sperm whale's jaw. I was struck by the singular posture he maintained, for his bone leg steadied in a hole drilled into the quarter-deck for that purpose. One arm was elevated, and he stood erect, looking straight out beyond the ship's ever-pitching prow. There was an infinity of firmest fortitude. Not a word he spoke, nor did his officers say aught to him. Ere long, from his first visit in the air, he withdrew into his cabin, but after that first morning he was every day visible to the crew. As the weather began to grow less gloomy, indeed he became less of a recluse, and by and by it came to pass that he was almost continually in the air. But as the clouds in the air were chased away, on his brow, they were piled layer upon layer. Nevertheless, ere long, the warm, warbling persuasiveness of the pleasant holiday weather we came to seemed gradually to slightly charm him from his mood. How shall we define the whale? By his obvious externals? Let us be short. A whale is a spouting fish with a horizontal tail. But there is so much more to describe of the majesty, the beauty, pride. And what a tail! Other poets have warbled the praises of the soft eye of the antelope and the lovely plumage of the bird that never alights. Less celestial, I celebrate the tail. The entire member is a web of strong, fibrous muscle running this way and that. Yet the subtle elasticity shows gestures that at times would well grace the hand of man. In an extensive herd, I have heard some whalemen say that with these mystic gestures, the whale intelligently converses with the world. Yet what is this whale? 
In scientific terms, man has strived to define what animals can be contained within the great ground plan of cetology, or study of the whale. I, for myself, will write when I have the time, and will create three books, subdivisible into chapters. The first book I shall call The Folio Whale. Here will be contained the sperm whale, the right whale, the fin-backed whale, the hump-backed whale, the razor-backed whale, and the sulfur-bottom whale. The second book shall be the octavo whale. Here contained will be descriptions of the grampus, the blackfish, the narwhale, the thrasher, and the killer. And the final third book will be the duodecimo whale. And here shall be the huzza porpoise, the algerine porpoise, and the mealy-mouth porpoise. But I shall probably never complete this. God keep me from completing anything. This whole book is but a draft. Oh, time, strength, cash, and patience. Some days elapsed, and ice and icebergs all astern, the Pequod now went rolling through the bright Quinto Spring, which at sea almost perpetually reigns on the threshold of the eternal August of the tropic. Old age is always wakeful, though, and it was so with Ahab that he now began to spend many a night upon deck. It was not a great while later that one morning, shortly after breakfast, Ahab, as was his wont when staying below, ascended the cabin gangway to the deck. Soon his steady ivory stride was heard. The hours wore on, and as it drew near the close of the day, suddenly he came to a halt by the bulwarks, and with one hand grasping a shroud, he ordered Starbuck to send everybody aft. Sir, said Starbuck, astonished at an order seldom or even given on board a ship. Send everybody aft, repeated Ahab. Masthead there, come down. When the entire ship's company were assembled, and with curious and not wholly unapprehensive faces were eyeing him, he continued pacing, and then vehemently pausing, cried, What do you do when you see a whale, men? Sing out for him, was the impulsive rejoinder. Good, cried Ahab with wild approval. Now all you mastheaders have before now heard me give orders about a white whale. Look ye, do you see this Spanish ounce of gold? Holding up a broad, bright coin to the sun. It's a sixteen-dollar piece, men. Whosoever of ye raises me a white-headed whale with a wrinkled brow and a crooked jaw, whosoever of ye raises me that white-headed whale with three holes punctured in his starboard fluke, look ye, whosoever of ye raises me that same white whale, he shall have this gold ounce, me boys. Huzzah, huzzah, cried the seaman. And with this, Ahab nailed the gold to the mast. But if ye see but a bubble, men, sing out. Captain Ahab, said Tashtego, that white whale must be the same that some call Moby Dick. Moby Dick, shouted Ahab. Do ye know the white whale then, Tash? Does he fantail a little curious, said the gay header. And has he a curious spout tool, very bushy, said Dagoo. And he have a good many irons in his side, Captain, cried Queequeg. Aye, Queequeg. The harpoons lie all twisted and wrenched in him. Death and devil's men. It is Moby Dick ye have seen. Captain Ahab, said Starbuck. But was it not Moby Dick that took off thy leg? Who told ye that? cried Ahab, then pausing. Aye, it was Moby Dick that dismasted me. Then tossing both arms with measureless imprecations, he shouted, Aye, aye. And I'll chase him round good hope, and round the horn, and round perdition's flames before I give up. And this is what ye have shipped for, men, to chase that white whale until he spouts black blood and rolls fin out. What say ye, men? Will ye splice hands on it now? I think ye do look brave. Ay, ay, shouted the harpooners and the seamen, running closer to the excited old man. A sharp eye for a white whale, a sharp lance for Moby Dick. God bless ye, he seemed to half sob and half shout. But what's this long face about, Mr. Starbuck? I'm game too, Captain. The great whale comes in the way of business, we follow. But I came to hunt whales. How many barrels will they vengeance yield thee, even if thou gettest it, Captain Ahab? It will not fetch thee much in our Nantucket market. Nantucket market, who? Let me tell thee that my vengeance will fetch a great premium here. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate. I will wreak that hate upon him. And the crew, man, the crew. Are they not one and all with Ahab? 
See, Stub, he laughs. Stand up against the hurricane. Thy one tossed sapling cannot, Starbuck. Speak, but speak. Ha! You cannot. Starbuck now is mine. Cannot oppose me now without rebellion. God keep me, keep us all, murmured Starbuck lowly. But in his joy at the enchanted, tacit acquiescence of the mate, Ahab did not hear his foreboding invocation. He cried on, The measure! The measure! Then receiving the brimming pewter and turning to the harpeneers, he ordered them to produce their weapons. Ranging them before him near the capstan, he stood for an instant, searchingly eyeing every man of his crew. Drink and pass, he cried. The crew alone now drink. Round with it, round! This they all did. Attend now, my braves. I have mustered ye all round this capstan that I may revive a noble custom of my fishermen fathers before me. Advance, ye mates. Cross your lances full before me. Well done. Let me touch the axis. So saying, he grasped the three level radiating lances at their crossed center. And now, ye mates, I do appoint ye three cupbearers to my three pagan kinsmen there, my valiant harpooners. Cut your seizings and draw the poles, ye harpooners. Silently obeying the order, the three harpooners now stood with the detached iron part of their harpoons, held barb up before him. Turn up the socket. And forthwith, slowly going from one officer to the other, he brimmed the harpoon sockets with the fiery waters from the pewter. Now three to three ye stand. Commend the chalices. Drink, ye harpooners. Drink and swear, all ye men, death to Moby Dick. God hunt us all if we do not hunt Moby Dick to his death. The long barbed steel goblets were lifted. Starbuck paled and turned and shivered. The crew drank again and cheered. Then Ahab waved his free hand to them, and they all dispersed, while the old captain retired to his cabin. It is sunset. We are in the cabin, by the stern windows. Ahab is sitting alone and gazing out. T'was not so hard a task. I thought to find one stubborn at the least. But my own cogged circle fits into all their various wheels, and they revolve. Oh, hard, that to fire others, the match itself must needs be wasting. What I've dared, I've willed, and what I've willed, I'll do. They think me mad. Starbuck does. But I'm demoniac. I am madness madden. The path to my fixed purpose is laid with iron rails. Not's an obstacle to the iron way. It is dusk by the mainmast. Starbuck is leaning against it. My soul is more than matched. She's overmanned and by a madman. Insufferable sting that sanity should ground arms on such a field. But he drilled deep down and blasted all reason out of me. Oh, I plainly see my miserable office. To obey, rebelling, and worse yet, to hate with a touch of pity. Time and tide flow wide. Thou hated whale has the round watery world to swim in, as the small goldfish has its glassy globe. Oh, God, to sail with such a heathen crew that have small touch of human mothers in them. Hark, the infernal orgies. Stand by me, hold me, bind me. Oh, ye blessed influences. First night watch at the foretop. Stub solace and mending a brace. Ha, 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 ha. Clear my throat. I've been thinking over it ever since. And that, ha, 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 has the final consequence. Why so? Because it laughs the wisest, easiest answer to all that's queer. Who calls? Mr. Starbuck. Aye, aye, sir. He's my superior. Aye, sir. Just through with this job. Coming. Midnight at the folks. Harpooners and sailors. The foresail is rising and falling, and discovers the watch standing, lounging, leaning, and lying in various attitudes, all singing in chorus. Farewell and adieu to you fair Spanish ladies. Farewell and adieu to you ladies of Spain. Our captain's commanded. First Nantucket sailor. Oh, boys, don't be sentimental. Take a tonic. Follow me. 
A captain stood upon the deck, a spyglass in his hand, a viewing of those gallant whales that blew at every strand. Mate's voice from the quarter deck. Eight bells there, forward! East boys, let's have a jig or two before we ride to anchor in Blanket Bay. Pip, little Pip, hurrah with your tambourine! The half of them dance to the tambourine. Some go below. Some sleep or lie among the coils of rigging. Oaths of plenty. Second Nantucket sailor. What's that I saw, lightning? No, Dagoo showing his teeth. Swallow thine mannequin. White skin, white liver. A row, a row, a row. Fair play. Snatch the Spaniard's knife. A ring, a ring. The squaw, the squaw. Jump, my jollies. Lord help such jollies. Crash, crash. There goes the job stay. Blang, wang. Here comes the royal yard. I, Ishmael, was one of them. A wild, sympathetic feeling was in me. Ahab's quenchless feud seemed mine. With greedy ears, I learned the history of that murderous monster against whom I and all the others had taken our oaths of violence and revenge. For some time past, though at intervals only, the unaccompanied, secluded white whale had haunted those uncivilized seas most frequented by the sperm whale fishermen. But only a few of them, comparatively, had knowingly seen him. And as for those who, previously hearing of the white whale, by chance caught sight of him, in the beginning of the thing, they had every one of them almost as boldly and fearlessly lowered for him as for any other whale of that species. But at length, such calamities did ensue in these assaults that reports had gone far to shake the fortitude of many brave hunters. Nor did wild rumors of all sorts fail to exaggerate and still the more horrify the true histories of these deadly encounters. No wonder, then, that the outblown rumors of the white whale did in the end incorporate with themselves all manner of morbid hints which eventually invested Moby Dick with new terrors. One of the wilder suggestions regarding the whale was the unearthly concept that Moby Dick was ubiquitous, that he had actually been encountered in opposite latitudes at one and the same instant of time, and indeed the strange secrets of the ocean currents may have made the strangest movements possible. Knowing that after many intrepid assaults the white whale survived, it may not be surprising that some whalemen should consider Moby Dick also immortal. But even stripped of these supernatural surmisings, there was enough in the earthly makeup and incontestable character of the monster to strike the imagination with unwanted power. For it was not so much his uncommon bulk that so much distinguished him from other sperm whales, but, as was elsewhere thrown out, a peculiar snow-white wrinkled forehead with a high pyramidical white hump. The rest of his body was so streaked and spotted and marbled with the same shrouded hue that in the end he had gained his distinctive appellation of the white whale. Nor was it his unwanted magnitude, nor his remarkable hue, nor yet his deformed lower jaw that so much invested the whale with natural terror as that unexampled intelligent malignity, which, according to specific accounts, he had over and over again evinced in his assaults. Judge then to what pitches of inflamed, distracted fury the minds of his more desperate hunters were impelled when amid the chips of chewed boats and the sinking limbs of torn comrades they swam out of the white curds of the whale's direful wrath into the serene, exasperating sunlight that smiled on, as if at a birth or a bridal. His three boats stove around him, and oars and men both whirling in the eddies. One captain, seizing the line knife from his broken prow, had dashed at the whale, blindly seeking with a six-inch blade to reach the fathom-deep life of the whale. That captain was Ahab. And then it was that suddenly sweeping his sickle-shaped lower jaw beneath him, Moby Dick had reaped away Ahab's leg. The white whale had swum before him as the monomaniac incarnation of all those malicious agencies which some men feel eating in them till they are left living on with half a heart and half a lung. It is not probable that this monomania in him took its instant rise at that precise time of his bodily dismemberment. Yet when by this laceration forced to turn towards home, and for long months of days and weeks, Ahab and Anguish lay stretched together in one hammock, then it was that his torn body and gashed soul fled into one another, and so interfusing made him mad. 
Human madness is oftentimes a cunning and most feline thing. When you think it fled, it may have but become transfigured into some still subtler form. Now in his heart, Ahab had some glimpse of this. Namely, all my means are sane, my motive and my object mad. Nevertheless, so well did he succeed in dissembling, that when with ivory leg he stepped ashore at last, no Nantucketer thought him otherwise but naturally grieved. Here then was this gray-headed, ungodly old man, chasing with curses a Job's whale around the world, at the head of a crew chiefly made up of mongrel renegades and castaways and cannibals. By what evil magic their souls were possessed, none can say, but at times his hate seemed almost theirs. Hist! Did you hear that noise, Kabako? It was the middle watch, a fair moonlight. It was in the midst of this repose that Archie, one of the cordon passing buckets to the scuttlebutt, whispered to his neighbor, a cholo, the words just mentioned. Take the bucket, will ye, Archie? What noise do you mean? There it is again, under the hatches. Don't you hear it? A cough. It sounded like a cough. Carumba, have done, shipmate, will you? It's the three soaked biscuits you ate for supper. Hark ye, Kabako, I've sharp ears. There is somebody in the afterhold that has not yet been seen on deck. Had you followed Captain Ahab down into his cabin after the squall that took place on the night succeeding the wild ratification of his purpose, you would have seen him go to a locker in the transom, and bringing out a wrinkled roll of yellowish sea charts, spread them before him on his screwed-down table. But it was not this night in particular that, in the solitude of his cabin, Ahab thus pondered over his charts. Almost every night they were brought out. Almost every night some pencil marks were effaced and others were substituted. For with the charts of all four oceans before him, Ahab was threading a maze of currents and eddies with a view to the more certain accomplishment of that monomaniac thought of his soul. Now the Pequot had sailed from Nantucket at the very beginning of the season on the line. No possible endeavor, then, could enable her commander to arrive in the equatorial Pacific in time to cruise there. Therefore, he must wait for the next ensuing season. Yet the premature hour of the Pequod sailing had perhaps been correctly selected by Ahab, with a view to this very complexion of things. Because an interval of three hundred and sixty-five days and nights was before him, an interval which instead of impatiently enduring ashore, he would spend in a miscellaneous hunt. Yet, regarded discreetly and coolly, seems it not but a mad idea, this, that in the broad, boundless ocean, one solitary whale, even if encountered, should be thought capable of individual recognition from his hunter. No, for the peculiar snow-white brow of Moby Dick and his snow-white hump could not but be unmistakable. God help thee, old man, thy thoughts have created a creature in thee, a vulture feeds upon that heart forever. That vulture, the very creature he creates. Though consumed with the hot fire of his purpose, Ahab and all his thoughts and actions ever had in view the ultimate capture of Moby Dick. To accomplish his object, he must use tools, and of all tools used in the shadow of the moon, men are of most use, but most apt to get out of order. He knew, for instance, in his heart, that his chief mate in his soul aboard his captain's quest. For this reason particularly, therefore, Ahab plainly saw that he must still in a good degree continue true to the natural nominal purpose of the Pequod's voyage, and so his voice now was often heard hailing the three mastheads and admonishing them to keep a bright lookout. This vigilance was not long without reward. It was a cloudy, sultry afternoon, the seamen were lazily lounging about the decks, and Queequeg and I were mildly employed creating what is called a sword mat for an additional lashing to our boat. Thus we were weaving and weaving away when I started at a sound so strange, long-drawn and musically wild and unearthly, that the ball of free will dropped from my hand, and I stood gazing up at the clouds whence that voice dropped like a wing. High aloft in the cross trees was that mad gay header Tashtego. There she blows! There! 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 She blows! She blows! Where away? On the lee beam, about two miles off, a school of them. 
Instantly, all was commotion. The sperm whale blows as a clock ticks, with the same undeviating uniformity, and thereby whalemen distinguish this fish from other tribes of his genus. Quick, steward! Time! Time! The steward hurried below, glanced at the watch, and reported the exact minute to Ahab. The ship was now kept away from the wind, and she went gently rolling before it. Tashtego reporting that the whales had gone down, heading to leeward, we confidently looked to see them again directly in advance of the bows. The sailors from the fore and mizzen had come down, and the three boats swung over the sea like three sapphire baskets over high cliffs. Outside of the bulwarks, their eager crews with one hand clung to the rail, while one foot was expectantly poised on the gunwale. But at that critical instant, a sudden exclamation was heard that took every eye from the whale. With a start, all glared at dark Ahab, who was surrounded by five dusky phantoms that seemed fresh-formed out of air. The phantoms, for so they then seemed, were flitting on the other side of the deck, and with a noiseless celerity were casting loose the tackles and bands of the boat which swung there. This boat had always been deemed one of the spare boats, though technically called the captain's, on account of its hanging from the starboard quarter. The figure that now stood by its bows was tall and swart, with one white tooth evilly protruding from its steel-like lips. A rumpled Chinese jacket of black cotton funereally invested him, but strangely crowning this ebonus was a glistening white-plated turban. Less swart in aspect, the companions of this figure were of that vivid tiger-yellow complexion peculiar to some of the aboriginal natives of the Manilas. Ahab cried out, All ready there, Fadala? Ready, was the half-hissed reply. Lower away, then, do you hear? Shouting across the deck to all the men. Such was the thunder of his voice, that spite of their amazement, the men sprang away from the rail. Goat-like, they leapt down the rolling ship's side into the tossed boats below. Hardly had they pulled out from under the ship's lee, when a fourth keel, coming from under the windward side, pulled round under the stern and showed the five strangers rowing Ahab, who, standing erect in the stern, loudly hailed Starbuck, Stub, and Flask, to spread themselves widely so as to cover a large expanse of water. But with all their eyes again riveted upon the swart Fadala and his crew, the inmates of the other boats obeyed not the command. Captain Ahab, said Starbuck. Spread yourselves, cried Ahab. Aye, aye, sir, surely cried little King Post, and then addressing his crew, There she blows right ahead, boys. Never heed yonder yellow boys, Archie. Oh, I don't mind him, sir, said Archie. I knew it. I heard him in the hold. Pull, pull, my fine children, drawlingly and soothingly side Stubb to his crew. What is it you stare at? There are only five more hands come to help us. The more the merrier. Meanwhile, in obedience to a sign from Ahab, Starbuck was now pulling across Stubb's bow. Mr. Starbuck, cried Stubb, larboard boat there. A word with you, sir. Hello, returned Starbuck, turning round not an inch his face like flint. What think ye of these yellow boys, sir? Smuggled on board. Strong now, boys. A sad business, Mr. Stubb. See there, see there, my lads. But never mind, sperm's the play. This at last is duty, duty and profit, hand in hand. Aye, aye, I thought as much, soliloquized Stubb when the boats diverged. The white whale's at the bottom of it. Meantime, Ahab, out of hearing of his officers, having sighted the furthest to windward, was still ranging ahead of the other boats. Those tiger-yellow creatures of his seemed all steel and whalebone. Fadala, who was seen pulling the harponeer oar, had thrown aside his black jacket and displayed his naked chest, while at the other end Ahab, with one arm, like a fencer's thrown half backward into the air, was seen steadily managing the steering oar. All at once... The outstretched arm gave a peculiar motion and then remained fixed, while the boat's five oars were seen simultaneously peaked. Boat and crew sat motionless on the sea. Instantly, the three spread boats in the rear paused in their way. The whales had irregularly settled bodily down into the blue. Every man look out along his oars, cried Starbuck. Thou, Queequeg, stand up. Nimbly springing up on the triangular raised box in the bow, the savage stood erect there. Not very far distant, Flask's boat was also lying breathlessly still. Dagoo stood tall and firm, and sitting on his back was the flaxen-haired Flask, seeming but a snowflake. Meanwhile Stubb, 
betrayed no such far-gazing solicitudes. As was his wont in such cases, he was resolved to solace the languishing interval with his pipe. When suddenly Tashtego, his harponeer, dropped like a light from his erect attitude to his seat, crying out, Down! Down all and give way! There they are! They had but seen a puff of vapor, yet now all four boats were in keen pursuit of that one spot of troubled water. It was a sight full of quick wonder and awe. The vast swells of the omnipotent sea, the surging hollow roar they made as they rolled along the eight gunnels, like gigantic bowls in a boundless bowling green. The jets of vapor no longer blended. The whales seemed separating their wakes. And soon we were running through a diffused wide veil of mist, neither ship nor boat to be seen. Give way, men, whispered Starbuck. There is time to kill a fish yet before the squall. Queequeg stood ready, harpoon in hand. That's his hump. There, there, give it to him. Queequeg's darted iron leapt out of the boat with a short rushing sound. Then all in one welded commotion came an invisible push from astern. The whole crew were half suffocated as they were tossed helter-skelter into the white curdling cream. Squall, whale, and harpoon had all blended together, and the whale, merely grazed by the iron, escaped. Swimming round the boat, we picked up the oars and tumbled back into our places. There we sat up to our knees in the sea while the wind increased to a howl, and the whole squall roared around us like a white fire upon the prairie. Meanwhile, the driving scud grew darker, and no sign of the ship could be seen, and there we sat through the night. Wet, drenched through, and shivering cold, despairing of ship or boat, we lifted up our eyes as the dawn came on. Suddenly Queequeg started to his feet, hollowing his hand to his ear. We all heard a faint creaking, and then suddenly the thick mists were dimly parted by a huge, vague form bearing right down upon us. Affrighted, we all sprang into the sea. Floating on the waves, we saw the abandoned boat tossed and gaped beneath the ship's bows, and then the vast hull rolled over it, and it was seen no more. At last we were taken up and landed on board, and it became clear that the other boats had cut loose from their fish and returned to the ship in good time before the squall. They had given us up, but were still cruising, if happily they might light upon some token of our perishing, an oar or a lance pole. Days, weeks passed, and under easy sail, the ivory Pequod had slowly swept across four several cruising grounds, that off the Azores, off the Cape de Verdes, on the plate, so-called, being off the mouth of the Rio de la Plata, and the Carol Ground, an unstaked watery locality southerly from St. Helena. It was while gliding through these latter waters that one serene night a silvery jet was seen far in advance of the white bubbles at the bow. Fadala first descried this jet and hailed the mortal crew. There she blows! But though the ship swiftly sped, yet the jet was no more seen that night and this midnight jet had almost become a forgotten thing, when some days after, lo, at the same silent hour, it was again announced, and once more it disappeared. And so it served us night after night, until, with the immemorial superstition of their race, some of the seamen swore that it must be Moby Dick. At last, when turning to the eastwards, the Cape winds started to blow for us. Cape of Good Hope, do they call ye? Rather Cape Tormentoto is called of yore, where the storms beat and the decks are forever wet. Steering northeastwards from the Crozettes, we fell in with vast meadows of Brit, the minute yellow substance upon which the right whale largely feeds. For leagues and leagues it undulated around us, so that we seemed to be sailing through boundless fields of ripe and golden wheat. On the second day, numbers of right whales were seen, who, secure from the attack of a sperm whaler like the Pequod, with open jaws sluggishly swam through the Brit, which, adhering to the fringing fibers of that wondrous Venetian blind in their mouths, was in that manner separated from the water that escaped at the lip. But it was only the sound the mowers made as they parted the Brit, which reminded us of their presence, as else their vast black forms looked more like lifeless rocks than anything else. Slowly wading through the meadows of Brit, the Pequod still held on her way northeastwards toward the island of Java. Still, at wide intervals in the silvery night, the lonely, alluring jet would be seen. But one transparent blue morning, 
when a stillness almost preternatural spread over the sea, a strange spectre was seen by Dagoo from the main masthead. In the distance, a great white mass lazily rose. Glistening for a moment, it slowly subsided and sank. It seemed not a whale, and yet is this Moby Dick, thought Dagoo. There, there again, there she breaches, right ahead, the white whale, the white whale. Upon this, the seamen rushed to the yard arms, and Ahab stood on the bowsprit, with one hand pushed far behind in readiness to wave his oars to the helmsman, his eager glance cast in the direction indicated aloft by the outstretched motionless arm of the negro. Whether the flitting attendants of the one still and solitary jet had gradually worked on Ahab, who could tell? But no sooner did he discern the white mass than with a quick intensity he gave orders for lowering. The four boats were soon on the water, and all swiftly pulling towards their prey. Soon it went down, and while, with oars suspended, we were awaiting its reappearance, lo, in the same spot where it had sank, once more it slowly rose, almost forgetting for the moment all thoughts of Moby Dick, we now gazed at the most wondrous phenomenon which the secret seas have hitherto revealed to mankind. A vast, pulpy mass, furlongs in length and breadth, of a glancing cream color, lay floating on the water. Innumerable long arms radiating from its center, curling and twisting like a nest of anacondas, an unearthly, formless, chance-like apparition of life. As with a slow sucking sound, it slowly disappeared again. Starbuck exclaimed, Almost rather had I seen Moby Dick and fought him, than to have seen thee, thou white ghost. What was it, sir? said Flask. The great live squid, which they say few whale ships ever beheld and returned to their ports to tell of it. But Ahab said nothing. Turning his boat, he sailed back to the vessel, the rest as silently following. If to Starbuck the apparition of the squid was a thing of portents, to Queequeg it was quite a different object. When you see him quid, said the savage, honing his harpoon in the bow of his hoisted boat, then you quick see him palm whale. The next day was exceedingly still and sultry and with nothing special to engage them, the Pequod's crew could hardly resist the spell of sleep induced by such a vacant sea. It was my turn to stand at the foremast head, and with my shoulders leaning against the slackened royal shrouds to and fro, I idly swayed in what seemed an enchanted air. Ere forgetfulness altogether came over me, I had noticed that the seamen at the main and mizzen mastheads were already drowsy so that at last all three of us lifelessly swung from the spars as over the wide trance of the sea, east nodded to west, and the sun over all. Suddenly bubbles seemed bursting beneath my closed eyes, and with a shock I came back to life, and lo, close under our lee, not forty fathoms off, a gigantic sperm whale lay rolling in the water. As if struck by some enchanter's wand, the sleepy ship and every sleeper in it all at once started into wakefulness. Simultaneously with the three notes from aloft being shouted forth, Clear away the boat's luff, cried Ahab, and obeying his own order, he dashed the helm down before the helmsman could handle the spokes. The sudden exclamations must have alarmed the whale, and ere the boats were down, majestically turning, he swam away to the leeward. But thinking that he might not yet be fully concerned, Ahab gave orders that no oars should be used, and no man speak but in whispers. Presently, as we thus glided in chase, the monster perpendicularly flitted his tail forty feet into the air, and then sank out of sight. There go flukes, was the cry, and after a short while the whale rose again, and being now in advance of the second mate's boat, Stubb counted upon the honor of the capture. It was obvious now that the whale had at length become aware of his pursuers. Yes, a mighty change had come over the fish. All alive to his jeopardy, he was going head out. Woo-hoo! Wahi! screamed the gay header. Kihi! Kihi! yelled Dagu. Kala! Kulu! howled Queequeg. And thus, with oars and yells, the keels cut the sea. Like desperados, Stubb's men tugged and strained. The harpoon was hurled. Stern all! the oarsmen backed water. The same moment, something went hot and hissing along every one of their wrists. It was the magical line attached to the stern and fed along the bulwarks. The boat now flew through the boiling water like a shark all fins. Thus they rushed, each man with might and main clinging to his seat. Haul in, haul in, cried Stubb to the bowsman, and facing round towards the whale, 
All hands began pulling the boat up to him, while yet the boat was being towed. Ranging firmly up the whale's flank, Stubb darted dart after dart into the flying fish. The red tide now poured from all sides of the monster like brooks down a hill. His tormented body rolled not in brine but in blood, and all the while, jet after jet of white smoke was agonizingly shot from the spiracle of the whale, and vehement puff after puff from the mouth of the excited headsman. Pull up! Pull up! he now cried. Close to! And the boat ranged along the fish's flank at which point Stubb thrust in, and then slowly churned his long, sharp lance into the fish, and kept it there, carefully churning and churning. And now it struck, for starting from his trance into that unspeakable thing called his flurry, the monster horribly wallowed in his blood. At last, abating from his flurry, the whale surging from side to side, gush after gush of clotted red gore shot into the frighted air, and falling back again, ran dripping down his motionless flanks into the sea. His heart had burst. Stubb's whale had been killed some distance from the ship. It was a calm, so forming a tandem of three boats, we commenced the slow business of towing the trophy to the Pequod. Darkness came on, but three lights up and down in the Pequod's main rigging dimly guided our way. Till drawing nearer we saw Ahab dropping several lanterns over the bulwarks and gazing a short while. He then withdrew sullenly and did not come forward again until the morning. Very soon you would have thought that all hands were preparing to cast anchor in the deep, but by the clanking chains the vast corpse itself, and not the ship, was to be moored. If moody Ahab was now all quiescence, his second mate flushed with conquest. A stake, a stake ere I sleep. You, Dagoo, overboard you go and cut me one from his small. About midnight that stake was cut and cooked and lighted by two lanterns of sperm oil, Stubb stoutly stood up to his spermaceti supper at the capstan head. Nor was Stubb the only banqueter. Mingling their mumblings with his own mastications, thousands on thousands of sharks swarming around the dead leviathan smackingly feasted on its fatness. It was a Saturday night, and such a Sabbath as followed. The Pequod was turned into what seemed a shamble, every sailor a butcher. In the first place, the enormous cutting tackles were swayed up to the main top and firmly lashed, and now suspended in stages over the side, Starbuck and Stubb, armed with their long spades, began cutting a hole in the body for the insertion of the hook. And this is how the business now continues. The hook is inserted, and the main body of the crew commence heaving in one dense crowd at the windlass until instantly the entire ship careens over. More and more she leans over, until at last a swift, startling snap is heard and with a great swash the ship swings back, bringing with it the disengaged end of the first strip of blubber. As the blubber envelops the whale precisely as the rind does an orange, so it is stripped from the body. For the strain constantly kept up by the windlass continually keeps the whale rolling over and over in the water, and as the blubber is being peeled along the line called the scarf, cut by Starbuck and Stubb with their spades, the end is being hoisted higher and higher aloft to the main brace. And thus the work proceeds the two tackles hoisting and lowering simultaneously, both whale and windlass heaving, the heaver singing, the blubber-room gentleman coiling, the mate scarfing, the ship straining, and all hands swearing occasionally by way of assuaging the general friction. Previous to completely stripping the body, the leviathan is beheaded, a not inconsiderable problem, considering that in the part where head and body seem to join, it seems to be the thickest part of it but Stubbs's boat achieved the feat in the rocking waves within ten minutes. All in the chains! Let the carcass go astern! The peeled white body of the beheaded whale flashes like a marble sepulcher. Slowly it floats more and more away, the water round it torn and splashed by the insatiate sharks, and the air above rent by the rapacious flights of screaming fowls. For hours and hours from the almost stationary ship the hideous sight is seen. Beneath the unclouded and mild azure sky, the great mass of death floats on and on, till lost in infinite perspectives. The head is now hoisted against the ship's side, about halfway out of the sea, so that it may yet in great part be buoyed up by its natural element. And when this last task was accomplished, it was noon, and the seamen went to their dinner. Silence reigned before the tumultuous but now deserted deck. A short space elapsed and into this noiselessness came Ahab, alone from his cabin. Taking a spade as a crutch, 
He struck it in the half-suspended mass and leaned over the head. It was a black and hooded head, and hanging there in the midst of so intense a calm, it seemed the sphinxes in the desert. Speak, thou vast and venerable head, muttered Ahab. Of all divers, thou hast dived the deepest. Thou hast seen the world's foundations where unrecorded names and navies rust. Speak now of all that thou knowest. But there was no sound. Over the next night and forenoon, the Pequod gradually drifted into a sea with patches of yellow brit, all the time carrying its prodigious head to its side. To the surprise of all, the announcement was made that a right whale should be captured that day if opportunity offered. Nor was this long wanting. Tall spouts were soon seen to leeward, and two boats, stubs and flasks, were detached in pursuit. An interval passed, and the boats were in plain sight in the act of being dragged right towards the ship by the towing whale. So close did the monster come to the ship that at first it seemed as if he meant it malice. But suddenly, going down in a maelstrom within three rods of the planks, he wholly disappeared from view as if diving under the keel. Cut! Cut! But having plenty of line yet in the tubs, there was no need. Round and round the Pequod the whale went, until tiring, he was hauled in, and finally flanking him on both sides, Stubb answered flask with lance for lance, and the multitudes of sharks that had before swum round the sperm whale's body rushed to the fresh blood that was spilled. At last, his spout grew thick, and with a frightful roll and vomit, he turned upon his back a corpse. I wonder what the old man wants with this lump of foul lard, said Stubb, as they were making fast cords to the flukes. Wants with it, said Flask. Did you never hear that the ship which but once has a sperm whale's head hoisted on her starboard side, and at the same time a right whale's on the larboard, did you never hear, Stubb, that that ship can never afterwards capsize? Why not? I don't know, but I heard that gamboge ghost of a Fadala saying so, and he seems to know all about ship's charms. He's the devil in disguise, I say. In disposing of the body of a right whale, when brought alongside the ship, the same preliminary proceedings commonly take place as in the case of a sperm whale. Only in this latter instance, the head is cut off whole, but in the former, the lips and tongue are separately removed and hoisted on deck. And all the while in this operation, on this occasion, Fadala was calmly eyeing the right whale, and Ahab chanced to stand so that the Parsi occupied his shadow, while if the Parsi's shadow was there at all, it seemed only to blend with and lengthen Ahab. The more I dive into this matter of whaling, so much the more am I impressed with its great honorableness and antiquity, that for six thousand years, and no one knows how many millions of ages before, the great whale should have been spouting all over the sea. This is surely a noteworthy thing. And of the nature of this creature, there is so much more than I can say here. So many whales, and we search for just one. The long and narrow peninsula of Malacca extending southwestward of the territories of Burma, forms the most southerly point of all Asia. In a continuous line from that peninsula stretch the long islands of Sumatra, Java, Bali, and Timor. The narrow straits of Sunda divide Sumatra from Java, and with a fair, fresh wind, the Pequod was now drawing nigh to these straits, purposing to pass through them into the Javan Sea, and thence cruising northwards over waters known to be frequented by the sperm whale sweep inland to the Philippine Islands and gain the far coast of Japan in time for the great whaling season there. Here Ahab, though everywhere else foiled in his pursuit, firmly counted upon giving battle to Moby Dick. But how now, in this zoned quest, does Ahab touch land? Surely he will stop for water. Nay, he needs no sustenance but what's in himself. Now, as many sperm whales had been captured off the western coast of Java, in the near vicinity of the Straits of Sunda, as the Pequod approached Java Head, the lookouts were repeatedly hailed and admonished to keep wide awake. But here be it premised that owing to the unwearied activity with which of late they have been hunted all over the four oceans, the sperm whales, instead of almost invariably sailing in small detached companies, are now frequently met in extensive herds. And indeed, broad on both bows, at the distance of some two or three miles, and forming a great semicircle embracing one half of the level horizon, they spied a continuous chain of whale jets, up playing and sparkling in the noonday air. 
Crowding all sail, the Pequod pressed after them, the harponeers handling their weapons and loudly cheering from the heads of their yet suspended boats. The Pequod at last shot by the vivid cockatoo point on the Sumatra side, emerging at last upon the broad waters beyond. Gradually the ship then gained on the whales, who had previously shot ahead, but now seemed happy to abate their speed, and word was passed to spring the boats. Yet no sooner did the herd, by some presumed wonderful instinct of the sperm whale, become notified of the three keels that were after them, though as yet a mile in their rear, than they rallied in forming in close ranks and battalions, moved on with redoubled velocity. Stripped to our shirts and drawers, we sprang to the white ash, and after several hours pulling were almost disposed to renounce the chase, when a general pausing commotion among the whales gave animating token that they were now at last under the influence of that strange perplexity of inert irresolution, which, when the fishermen perceive it in the whale, they say he is gallied in all directions, aimlessly swimming hither and thither, they plainly betrayed their distraction of panic. But though many were individual in violent motion, collectively they remained in one place. The boats at once separate, each making for some one lone whale on the outskirts of the shoal. In about three minutes' time, Queequeg's harpoon was flung, the stricken fish darted blinding spray in our faces, and then running away with us like light, steered straight for the heart of the herd. Though such a movement is in no wise unprecedented, it presents one of the more perilous vicissitudes of the fishery. As blind and deaf the whale plunged forward, our beset boat was like a ship mobbed by ice isles in a tempest. But not a bit daunted, Queequeg steered us manfully, Starbuck stood up in the bows, lance in hand, pricking out of our way whatever whales he could reach by short darts. For there was no time to make long ones, nor were the oarsmen quite idle. They chiefly attended to the shouting part of the business. Out of the way, Commodore! cried one to a great dromedary, and as many whales as possible they attempted to wing with drugged harpoons so that they could be afterwards killed at their leisure. This would not have been possible were it not that as we advanced into the herd, our whale's way greatly diminished, so that when at last the jerking harpoon drew out and the towing whale sideways vanished, then, with the tapering force of his parting momentum, we glided between two whales into the innermost heart of the shoal, as if from some mountain torrent we had slid into a serene valley lake. Yes, we were now in the enchanted calm which they say lurks at the heart of every commotion. Keeping at the center of the lake, we were occasionally visited by small tame cows and calves, the women and children of this routed host. Like household dogs, they came snuffling round us. But far beneath this wondrous world upon the surface, another and still stranger world met our eyes as we gazed over the side. For, suspended in those watery vaults, floated the forms of the nursing mothers of the whales. As when the stricken whale, that from the tub has reeled out hundreds of fathoms of rope, so now Starbuck saw long coils of the umbilical cord of Madame Leviathan, by which the young cub seemed still tethered to its dam. Some of the subtlest secrets of the sea seemed divulged to us in this enchanted pond. Meanwhile, as we thus lay entranced, the occasional sudden frantic spectacles in the distance evinced the activity of the other boats. But the sight of the enraged, drugged whales now and then blindly darting to and fro across our circles was nothing to what at last met our eyes. A whale wounded, as we afterwards learned, but not effectually, had broken away from a boat carrying along with him half of the harpoon line. And in the extraordinary agony of the wound, he was now dashing among the revolving circles of whales, carrying dismay wherever he went. He had also run away with the cutting spade in him, and while the free end of the rope attached to that weapon had permanently caught in the coils of the harpoon line round his tail, the cutting spade itself had worked loose from his flesh so that tormented by madness he was now churning through the water, violently flailing with his flexible tail and tossing the keen spade about him, wounding and murdering his own comrades. This terrific object seemed to recall the whole herd from their stationary fright. Yes, the long calm was departing. A low advancing hum was soon heard, and then, like to the tumultuous masses of block ice when the great river Hudson breaks up in spring, the entire host of whales came tumbling in upon their inner center, as if to pile themselves up in one common mountain. Instantly, Starbuck and Queequeg changed places, Starbuck taking the stern. Oars, oars, he intensely whispered, seizing the helm. Grip your oars and clutch your souls now. My God, men, stand by. Shove him off. You, Queequeg, the whale there, prick him, hit him, stand up, stand up, and stay so. Spring men, pull men, never mind their backs, scrape them, scrape away. 
By desperate endeavor, we at last shot into a temporary opening, then giving way rapidly, and at the same time earnestly watching for another opening. After many similar hairbreadth escapes, we at last glided into what had just been one of the outer circles, but now crossed by random whales, all violently making for one center. Riotous and disordered as the universal commotion now was, it soon resolved itself into a systematic onward flight. Further pursuit was useless, but the boat still lingered in the wake to pick up what drugged whales might be dropped astern. The result of this lowering was somewhat illustrative of the sagacious saying in the fishery, the more whales, the less fish. We found no more whales now for a long time, and the business of dividing and harvesting our two carcasses was only interrupted by a brief whale ship meeting, or GAM as we call it, with a passing French vessel which had unwisely tied itself to a rotting leviathan, from which we nevertheless were able to extract a good prize of some precious ambergris. The business with our whales was finally concluded with the romantic proceeding of decanting off their oils into casks, and then striking them down into the holes and a day or two after you could have pricked your ears in this ship, and were it not for the telltale boats and triworks, you would all but swear you trod some silent merchant vessel. All the decks were so scrubbed and quiet. But mark, aloft there, at the three mastheads, stand three men intent on spying out more whales, and the ship will go through the whole weary thing again. Ship ahoy! Has seen the white whale? So cried Ahab, hailing a ship showing English colors, bearing down under the stern. Has seen the white whale? See you this, returned the fine-looking captain coming closer, and withdrawing an apparently empty sleeve, he held up a white arm of bone, terminating in a wooden head like a mallet. In less than five minutes, Ahab's yellow crew were in their boat, and boarding the Samuel Enderby, where tales of the great Leviathan were then fulsomely exchanged. And he took off that arm, did he? asked Ahab, now sliding down from the capstan. Aye, he was the cause of it. Spin me the yarn, said Ahab. How was it? And the Englishman told his tale. It was the first time in my life I ever cruised on the line, here referring to the equator. I was ignorant of the white whale. Well, one day we lowered for a part of four or five whales, and were doing quite well. When up breaches from the bottom of the sea, a bouncing great whale, with a milky white head and hump all crow's feet and wrinkled. It was he, it was he, cried Ahab, suddenly letting out his suspended breath. And harpoon sticking in his starboard fin. Aye, aye, they were mine, my irons, cried Ahab, but on. Well, this old grandfather with the white head and hump runs all of foam into the pod and goes to snapping at my fast line. Aye, wants to free the fast fish, an old trick, I know him. How it was, I do not know. But in biting the line, it got foul of his teeth, and when we pulled on the line, we came plump up onto his hump. I resolved to capture him, but look you, the next minute I was blind as a bat, befogged with the black foam as the whale's tail loomed straight up from the sea like a marble steeple. The harpoon which I had attached to his side, he took down with me holding on, down into hell's flames. All of a sudden, thank the good God, the barb ripped its way along the whole length of my arm, and up I floated. But what became of the white whale? cried Ahab again. Didst thou cross his wake again? Twice. But could not fasten? Didn't want to try to. Ain't one limb enough? But how long since thou sawest him last? Which way heading? For God's sake, man, tell! Bless my soul, this man's blood. Bring the thermometer. Avast! roared Ahab. Man the boat! Which way heading? Good God, cried the English captain. What's the matter? He was heading east, I think. Is your captain crazy? Whispering to Fadala. But Fadala, putting a finger on his lips, slid over the bulwarks with old thunder, and the Pequod was soon on its way. The precipitating manner in which Captain Ahab had quitted the Samuel Enderby had not been unattended with some small violence to his own person. He had alighted with such energy that his ivory leg had half splintered. This improved his already sullen temper not a bit, and over the following days the ship's carpenter worked day and night on a jawbone piece from the sperm to fashion a new stump. Now at about this time it was reported that some leak must have struck in the casks, but on searching the most recent no problem was found. Queequeg was then deputed to crawl amongst the most ancient barrels, amongst the dampness and slime, to discover the offense. But a thing happened then which affected me most. 
a well or an ice house this proved to Queequeg, and strange to say, for all the heat of his sweatings, he caught a terrible chill which lapsed into a fever, and at last, after some days' suffering, this laid him in his hammock, close to the very sill of the door of death. Not a man of the crew but gave him up, and he faintly called one to him in the grey morning watch, and taking his hand said that while in Nantucket he had chanced to see little canoes of dark wood, and on inquiry he had learned that all whalemen who died in Nantucket were laid in these same dark canoes, and that the fancy of being so laid had much pleased him. The carpenter, while a little bemused by the request, nevertheless took the necessary measurements, and with a lid duly planed and fitted, presented the coffin to Queequeg, and I waited for the worst reports. But now that he had apparently made every preparation for death, now that his coffin was proved a good fit, Queequeg suddenly rallied, such that there seemed no need of the canoe. The reason was this. At a critical moment he had just recalled a little duty ashore, and therefore had changed his mind about dying. With a wild whimsiness he now used the coffin for a sea chest. Meanwhile we journeyed across the vast ocean, and gliding by the Bashi Isles we emerged at last upon the great South Sea. Were it not for other things, I could have greeted my dear Pacific with uncounted thanks. For now the long supplication of my youth was answered. That serene ocean rolled eastwards with me a thousand leagues of blue. Launched at length upon these almost final waters, and gliding towards the Japanese cruising ground, the old man's purpose intensified itself. In his very sleep his ringing cry ran through the vaulted hull, Stern all! The white whale spouts thick blood! We saw very little life then for many days, but after greeting briefly a homeward-bound Nantucketer, who knew nothing of Moby Dick, and therefore presented no interest to our captain, whales were seen and four were slain, one by Ahab. The season for the line at length drew near, and every day when Ahab, coming from his cabin, cast his eyes aloft, the eager mariners would quickly run to the braces, impatient for the order to point the ship's prow to the equator. In good time, the order came. Now in that Japanese sea, the days in summer are as freshets of effulgence. Warmest climes, though, but nurse the cruelest fangs, and towards evening of that day, the Pequod was torn of her canvas, and Bearpold was left to fight a typhoon which had struck her directly ahead. Holding by a shroud, Starbuck was standing on the quarter-deck while Stubb and Flask were directing the men in the higher hoisting and firmer lashing of the boats. But all their pains seemed naught. Ahab's boat, lifted to the very top of the cranes, was struck by a giant rolling sea, and it stove in the bottom, leaving it dripping like a sieve. Bad work, bad work, Mr. Starbuck, said Stubb, but the sea will have its way. Stubb, for one, can't fight it. Avast, cried Starbuck. If thou art a brave man, thou wilt hold thy peace. But I'm not brave, said Stubb. Then thou art a fool. But who's there? Old Thunder, cried Ahab, groping his way along the bulwarks, yet suddenly finding his path made plain to him by elbowed lances of fire. Now as the lightning rod to aspire on shore is intended to carry off the perilous fluid into the soil, so there are kindred rods from each mast at sea. But as they must not touch wood, and are generally made of long slender links, and could impede a ship in normal progress, they are only thrown to the sea as the occasion demands. The rods, the rods, cried Starbuck to the crew. Are they overboard? Drop them fore and aft. Avast, let them be, sir. But look aloft, cried Starbuck. The corpusants, the corpusants. All the yard arms were tipped with a pallid fire, each of the three tall masts silently burning in that sulphurous air, and suddenly all were wrapped in a pall of white. Aye, aye, men, cried Ahab. Look up at it. Mark it well, the white flame but lights the way to the white whale. Then Starbuck cried, The boat, the boat, look at thy boat, old man. From the harpoon left in the shattered hulk, a flame of fire leapt forth. God is against the old man, tis an ill voyage, turn back. Overhearing Starbuck, the panic-stricken crew instantly ran to the braces, but snatching the burning harpoon, Ahab waved it like a torch among them. All your oaths to hunt the white whale are as binding as mine, and heart, soul, and body, and lungs, and life, Ahab is bound. And that ye may know to what tune this heart beats, thus I blow out the last fear. And with one blast of his breath, he extinguished the flame. 
And at these last words, many of the mariners did run from Ahab in a terror of dismay. At last, when the ship drew near to the outskirts, as it were, of the equatorial fishing ground, the watch, then headed by Flask, was startled by a cry so plaintively wild and unearthly that one and all started from their reveries, and sat or stood or leaned and listened. Below in his hammock, Ahab did not hear, but the following morning, when this was recounted to him by Flask, he laughed and told them all the cause. These rocky islands were the resort of a large number of young seals that had lost their dams, and sailing by the ship had cried with their strange human sort of wail. But even explained, it badly struck the crew. And the bodings of the crew were destined for another foreboding, when at sunrise the man who mounted the masthead at the fore, whether he was not yet waked or what, suddenly fell from his perch into the brine. And when they launched the life boy, a long slender cast, it had lain so long in the sun that it had dried completely in the parched wood filling in every pore, it too sunk. And thus the first man of the Pequod that mounted the mast to look out for the white whale on the white whale's own peculiar ground, that man was swallowed up in the deep. The lost life boy was now to be replaced, but as no cask of sufficient lightness could be found, Queequeg hinted that his canoe might do, and despite some forebodings this was agreed and the Pequod sailed with a coffin hung for emergency across the stern. The next day, a large ship was descried, bearing directly down upon the Pequod. At first they took this as a good omen, but as the broad-winged windward stranger shot nigh to them, the boastful sails all fell, and all life sped from the smitten hulk. Bad news, bad news, muttered an old manxman. But before the captain, with trumpet raised, could speak to the Pequod to tell his tale, Ahab's voice was heard. Hast seen the white whale? Aye, yesterday. Have you seen a boat adrift? Throttling his joy, Ahab negatively answered this question, and too excited by the prospect of the closeness of his prey, would have fain boarded the other vessel immediately, when the stranger captain was seen descending for the journey himself. Miserably arrived on board, the captain then spoke. It seemed that while three boats of the Rachels, as it was called, were out engaged with a shoal some four or five miles from the ship, the white hump and head of Moby Dick had suddenly loomed up out of the blue water. A fourth boat was immediately launched to give chase, and seemed to succeed in fastening, when according to the watch at the masthead, the diminished dotted boat suddenly turned into a swift gleam of bubbling white water, and after that there was nothing more. The story told the stranger captain immediately went on to reveal his object in boarding the Pequod. He desired that ship to unite with his own in the search. My boy, my own boy is among them. For God's sake, I beg you, I conjure. Here exclaimed the stranger captain to Ahab, who thus far had icily received his petition. For eight and forty hours let me charter your ship. I will gladly pay for it. His son, cried Stubb. What says Ahab? We must save that boy. I will not go, said the stranger, till you say aye to me. Yes, yes, I see you relent. Run, run, men, now, and stand by to square in the yards. Avast, cried Ahab. Touch not the rope yarn. Captain Gardner, I will not do it. Even now I lose time. Goodbye, goodbye. God bless ye, man, and may I forgive myself. Mr. Starbuck, let the ship sail as before. Hurriedly turning with averted face, he descended into his cabin, leaving the strange captain transfixed. Then Gardiner silently hurried to the side, more fell than stepped into his boat, and returned to his ship, and soon the two ships diverged their wakes. And now that at the proper time and place, after so long and wide a preliminary cruise, Ahab seemed to have chased his foe into an ocean fold, so Ahab's purpose now fixedly gleamed down upon the constant midnight of the gloomy crew. All humor, forced or natural, vanished. Stubb no more strove to raise a smile. Starbuck no more strove to check one. Like machines, they dumbly moved about the deck. Now at no time, by night or day, could the mariners step upon the deck, but Ahab was before them. His whole life was now become one watch on deck. Ahab by his scuttle and the Parsee by the mainmast, fixedly gazing upon one another. At the first glimmering of dawn, his iron voice was heard, Man the mastheads! But when three or four days had slided by, after meeting the children seeking Rachel, and no spout had yet been seen, the monomaniac old man seemed distrustful of his crew's fidelity. I will have the first sight of the whale myself, he said. Aye, 
Ahab must have the gold doubloon. And with his own hands he rigged a nest of basketed bowlines and gave words for his mate to hoist him to his perch. And thus, with one hand clinging round the royal mast, Ahab gazed upon the sea for miles and miles. The intense Pequod sailed on, and another ship, most miserably misnamed the Delight, was descried. Upon the stranger's shears were beheld the shattered white ribs and some few splintered planks of what had once been a whaleboat. I seen the white whale? Look, replied the hollow-cheeked captain, and with his trumpet he pointed to the wreck. As killed him? The harpoon is not yet forged that will ever do that. Not forged, cried Ahab. Look ye, Nantucketer, here in this hand I hold his death. Then God keep thee, old man. Seest thou that? Pointing to the hammock. I bury but one of five stout men that were alive only yesterday. May the resurrection and the life... Brace forward, up helm, cried Ahab suddenly. But the startled Pequod was not quick enough to escape the sound of the splash that the corpse soon made as it struck the sea. As Ahab now glided from the dejected delight, the strange life-boy hanging at the Pequod's stern came into conspicuous relief. In vain, O oh ye strangers, cried a foreboding voice in their wake. Ye fly our sad burial. Ye but turn us your taffrail to show us your coffin. It was a clear steel-blue day. Hither and thither on high glided the snow-white wings of small, unspeckled birds. These were the gentle thoughts of the feminine air. But to and fro, from in the deeps, far down in the bottomless blue, rushed mighty leviathans, swordfish, and sharks, and these were the strong, troubled, murderous thinkings of the masculine sea. Slowly crossing the deck from the scuttle, Ahab leaned over the side and more and more strove to pierce the profundity. From beneath his slouched hat he dropped a tear into the sea, nor did all the Pacific contain such wealth as that one wee drop. Starbuck saw the old man, saw him, how he heavily leaned over the side. Careful not to touch him, he yet drew near to him and stood there. Ahab turned. Starbuck. Sir. Oh, Starbuck, it is a mild, mild wind and a mild-looking sky. On such a day I struck my first wave. A boy harponeer of eighteen, forty, forty, forty years ago, forty years on the pitiless sea, when I think of this life I have led, the desolation of solitude it has been, oh, weariness, heaviness, God, 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 crack my heart, stave my brain. Oh, my captain, my captain, noble soul, grand old heart after all, let us flow these deadly waters, let us home, away, sir. They have some such mild blue days, even as this, in Nantucket. They have. I have seen them about this time. Yes, it is the noon nap now. The boy vivaciously wakes. His mother tells him of me, old cannibal me, how I am abroad upon the deep, but will yet come back to dance him again. Tis my Mary. She promised me that my boy every morning should be carried to the hill to catch the first glimpse of his father's sail. But Ahab's glance was averted. Like a blighted fruit tree, he shook. What is it? What nameless, inscrutable, unearthly thing is it that against all natural lovings and longings I so keep pushing? By heaven, man, we are turned round and round in this world like yonder windless, and fate is the handspike. I toil we how we may. We all sleep at last on the field. Starbuck. But blanched to a corpse's hue with despair, the mate had stolen away. Ahab crossed the deck to gaze over the other side, but started at two reflected fixed eyes in the water there. Badala was motionlessly leaning over the same rail. That night in the midwatch, the old man suddenly thrust out his face fiercely and declared that the whale must be near. Soon that peculiar odor, sometimes to a great distance given forth by the living sperm whale, was palpable to all the watch. Ahab rapidly ordered the ship's course and the sail to be shortened. Then, lengthwise ahead, smooth as oil, the polished metallic-like marks of some swift tide-rip at the mouth of a deep, rapid stream. Man the mastheads! Call all hands! Thundering with the butts of three clubbed handspikes on the forecastle deck, Dagoo roused the sleepers. There she blows! A hump like a snow hill! It is Moby Dick! cried Ahab from his perch. 
Fired by the cry, which seemed simultaneously taken up by the three lookouts, the men on deck rushed to the rigging. The whale was now a mile or so ahead, regularly jetting his silent spout in the air. And to the credulous mariners it seemed the same silent spout they had seen in the moonlit Atlantic and Indian Oceans. And did none of you see it before? cried Ahab. I saw him almost the same instant, said Tashtego. Not the same instant. Not the same. No, the doubloon is mine. Lower me, Mr. Starbuck. Lower, lower. He's heading straight to the leeward, sir, cried Stubb. Be dumb, man. Stand by the braces. Boats! Boats! Soon all the boats but Starbucks were dropped, all the paddles plying. Like noiseless nautilus shells, their light prows sped through the sea. At length, the breathless hunter came so nigh his seemingly unsuspecting prey that his entire dazzling hump was distinctly visible. And like to some flagstaff rising from the painted hull of an argosy, the tall but shattered pole of a recent lance projected from the white whale's back. On each bright side, the whale shed off enticings. Yes, calm, enticing calm. O oh, whale, thou glidest on no matter how many thou mayest have be juggled and destroyed before. And thus, through the serene tranquility of the tropical sea, Moby Dick moved on, still withholding from sight the full terrors of his submerged trunk, entirely hiding the wrenched hideousness of his jaw. But soon the forepart slowly rose from the water. For an instant his whole marbleized body formed a high arch like Virginia's natural bridge, and warningly waving his bannered flukes in the air, the grand god revealed himself, sounded, and went out of sight. With oars apeak, the three boats now stilly floated. An hour, said Ahab, standing rooted in his boat's stern, gazing out. Yet after much lesser time, The birds! The birds! cried Tashtego. Their vision was keener than man's. Ahab could discover no sign in the sea, but suddenly, as he peered down and down into its depths, he profoundly saw a white living spot no bigger than a white weasel, with wonderful celerity uprising, and then there were plainly revealed two long crooked rows of white glistening teeth floating up from the undiscoverable bottom. The glittering mouth yawned beneath the boat like an open-doored marble tomb, and with sudden realization giving one sidelong sweep with his steering oar, Ahab whirled the craft aside. Now by this timely spinning of the boat, the bow was made to face the whale's head. But as if perceiving the stratagem, Moby Dick, with that malicious intelligence ascribed to him, sidingly transplanted himself and shot his pleated head lengthwise beneath the boat. And now, in the manner of a biting shark, one of his teeth caught in a rowlock, and as the whale dallied with the doomed craft in his devilish way, then it was that the monomaniac Ahab, furious with this tantalizing vicinity of his foe, seized the long bone with his naked hands, and wildly strove to wrench them from its grasp. As he thus vainly strove, the jaw slipped from him, the frail gunnels bent in, collapsed, and snapped as both jaws, sliding further apart, bit the craft completely in twain, and locked themselves fast between the two floating wrecks. And soon, resuming his horizontal attitude, Moby Dick swam swiftly round and round the wrecked crew. Sail on the whale! Drive him off! shouted Ahab as he thrashed in the open sea. And obeying his urgent command, the Pequod's prows, now fortunately close, were pointed, and breaking up the charmed circle, she effectually parted the white whale from his victim, and sullenly he swam off. Dragged into Stubbs's boat with bloodshot, blinded eyes, the long tension of Ahab's bodily strength did crack. Far inland, nameless cries came from him, as desolate sounds from out ravines. The ship itself, then, as it sometimes happens, offered the most promising intermediate means of overtaking the chase. Accordingly, the boats now made for her and were stowed. The Pequod bore down upon the leeward wake, but they made no headway, and soon with dark the day was done. At daybreak the three mastheads were punctually manned afresh. You see him, cried Ahab. See nothing, sir. Make sail. He travels faster than I thought. The ship tore on. By salt and hemp, cried Stubb. But this swift motion of the deck creeps up one's legs and tingles at the heart. There she blows! She blows! She blows! Was now the masthead cry. Aye, aye, said Stubb. Ye cannot escape. The mad fiend himself is after ye. And Stubb spoke out for well nigh all that crew, for they were now one man, not thirty. There she breaches! 
I breach your last to the sun, Moby Dick, cried Ahab. Lower away, he cried, as he stepped into his own spare boat. Mr. Starbuck, the ship is thine. And as they lowered, as if to strike terror into the crews, Moby Dick had now turned and was coming directly for them. Skillfully maneuvered, they managed to elude him, but sometimes only by a plank's breadth. But at last, in his untraceable evolutions, the slack of three lines now fast to him, the whale drew aside a little, and Ahab took the opportunity to foreshorten, when, lo, a sight more savage than the embattled teeth of sharks. Caught and twisted, corkscrewed in the mazes of line, loose harpoons and lances, with all their bristling barbs and points, the giant whale came flashing and dripping right up to the chocks in the bows of Ahab's boat. Only one thing could be done. Seizing the boat knife, he slashed and was suddenly fast again. That instant, the white whale made a sudden rush among the remaining tangles of the other lines. By so doing, dashed stubs and flasks boats together like two rolling husks, and then diving down into the sea, disappeared in a boiling maelstrom. While the two crews were yet circling in the water amongst the wreckage, shooting perpendicularly from the sea, the white whale dashed his broad forehead against the one remaining boat, and sent it turning over and over into the air, till it fell, and Ahab and his men struggled out from under it. As before, the attentive ship came bearing down to the rescue and picked up all those floating free. But when they came to count, one was not with them. Fadala, the Parsi, caught in Ahab's discarded line and dragged under. When dusk descended, the ferocious whale was still in sight to leeward. So once more the sail was shortened and everything passed nearly as on the previous night. The morning of the third day dawned fresh and fair. You see him, cried Ahab, but the whale was not yet in sight, and they crawled across the flat sea for hour upon hour. Aloft there, what do you see? Nothing, sir. Nothing? And noon at hand? The doubloon goes begging. See the sun? I've oversailed him. Fool! Come down, all of ye but the regulars. Man the main braces. Against the wind he now steers for the open jaw, murmured Starbuck to himself. A whole hour now passed, gold beaten out to ages. But at last, some three points off the weather bow, Ahab descried the spout again, and instantly from the three mastheads three shrieks went up. Forehead to forehead I meet thee this third time, Moby Dick. Brace sharper up. He's too far off to lower yet, Mr. Starbuck. In due time the boats were lowered. And as Ahab descended, he called to the mate and bade him pause. Starbuck, tis true that some may die at ebb tide, and some at low water. I feel now like a billow that's all one crested comb. I am old. Shake hands with me, man. Their hands met, their eyes fastened. Starbuck's tears the glue. Lower away, cried Ahab. Stand by the crew. In an instant, the boat was pulling round close under the stern. The sharks! The sharks! cried a voice. Oh, master, come back! But Ahab heard nothing, and as they pulled away, vast numbers of sharks, seemingly rising from the deep waters, maliciously snapped at the oars every time they dipped in the water. The boats had not gone very far, when, by a signal from the mastheads, Ahab knew that the whale had sounded. Suddenly the waters around them slowly swelled in broad circles, then quickly upheaved. A low rumbling sound was heard, a subterraneous hum, and then all held their breaths, as bedraggled with trailing ropes a vast form shot lengthwise, but obliquely from the sea, hovered for a moment, and then fell swamping back into the deep. Give way, cried Ahab, and the boats darted forward. But maddened by yesterday's fresh irons that corroded in him, Moby Dick seemed combinedly possessed by all the angels that fell from heaven. He came back churning among the boats, spilling out irons and lances, but strangely leaving Ahab's boat and crew intact. At that moment, a quick cry went up, and they all looked to the whale. Pinioned in the turns upon turns in which during the past night the whale had reeled the involutions of the lines around him, the half-torn body of the Parsi was seen his sable raiment frayed to shreds, his distended eyes turned full upon old Ahab. The captain dropped his harpoon and stared. Be fooled, be fooled, I, Parsi, I see thee again, but we cannot and must not stop. Away, mates, where's the whale? Oh, Ahab, cried Starbuck, not too late is it to desist. 
See, Moby Dick seeks thee not. It is thou, thou that madly seekest him. Setting sail to the rising wind, the lonely boat was swiftly impelled to the leeward, and as Ahab turned alongside the ship, he called Starbuck to follow, but not too close. Whether fagged by the three days running chase, or whether it was some latent deceitfulness, the white whale's way now began to abate. Aid not those shark's teeth! Pull on! But at every bite, sir, the thin blades grow smaller and smaller. They will last long enough. We near him now. Let me take the helm. At length, as the craft ran along the white whale's flank, he seemed strangely oblivious of its advance. Ahab was now within the mist. He was close, and now with body arched and both arms lengthwise, high lifted to the poise, he darted his fierce iron and his far fiercer curse into the hated whale. As if sucked into a morass, Moby Dick sideways writhed and suddenly canted the boat over, throwing three crewmen into the brine and leaving Ahab but clinging on. Almost simultaneously, the white whale darted through the weltering sea. But when Ahab cried out to take new turns with the line, the moment that treacherous line felt that double strain and tug, it snapped in midair. Hearing the tremendous rush of the sea-crashing boat, the whale wheeled round, but in that evolution catching sight of the nearing black hull of the ship, bethinking it, it may be, a larger and nobler foe, of a sudden he bore down upon its advancing prow, smiting his jaw amid fiery showers of foam. Ahab staggered. Oars, oars, the ship, the ship, dash on, my men, will ye not save my ship? But as the oarsmen violently forced their boat through the sledge-hammering seas, and before the whale-smitten bow ends gave in, and water flooded through, meantime, for that one beholding instant, Tashtego's masthead hammer remained suspended in his hand, while Starbuck and Stubb, standing upon the bowsprit, caught sight of the downcoming monster just as soon as he. The whale, the whale! Up helm, up helm! Oh, all ye sweet powers of air! My God, stand by me now! cried the mate. From the ship's bows, nearly all seamen now hung inactive, all their enchanted eyes intent upon the whale. Retribution, swift vengeance, eternal malice were in his whole aspect, and spite of all that mortal man could do, the solid white buttress of his forehead smote the ship's starboard bow, till men and timbers reeled. Through the breach they all heard the waters pour. The ship, the hearse, the second hearse, cried Ahab from the boat. Its wood could only be American. Diving beneath the settling ship, the whale ran quivering along its keel, but turning under water, swiftly shot to the surface again, far off from the other bow, but within a few yards of Ahab's boat, where for a time he lay quiescent. What ho, Tashtego! Let me hear thy hammer! Death glorious ship! Must he then perish and without me? Am I cut off from the last fond pride of meanest shipwreck captains? O oh, lonely death on lonely life! Towards thee I roll! Thou all-destroying but unconquering whale, to the last I grapple with thee, from hell's heart I stab at thee. Thus I give up the spear. The harpoon was darted. The stricken whale flew forward. With igniting velocity the line ran through the groove, ran foul. Ahab stopped to clear it. Success. But the flying turn caught him round the neck, and voicelessly he was shot out of the boat ere the crew knew he was gone. Next instant, the heavy eye splice at the rope's end flew out of the stark empty tub, knocked down an oarsman, and smiting the sea, disappeared in its depths. For an instant the tranced boat's crew stood still. The ship? Great God, where is the ship? Soon they, through dim, bewildering mediums, saw her sidelong fading phantom, only the uppermost parts out of the water. And now concentric circles seized the lone boat itself, and all its crew and each floating oar, and every lance pole, and spinning, animate and inanimate, all round and round in one vortex, carried the smallest chip of the Pequod out of sight. But as the last whelmings poured themselves over the sunken head of Tashtego at the mast, a skyhawk that had followed the ship chanced to intercept its broad fluttering wing between the hammer and wood. And so the bird of heaven, with archangelic shrieks, went down with his ship, which, like Satan, would not sink to hell till she had dragged a living part of heaven along with her and helmeted herself with it. Now small fowls flew screaming over the yet yawning gulf. 
A sullen white surf beat against its steep side, then all collapsed, and the great shroud of the sea rolled on as it rolled five thousand years ago. The drama's done. Why, then, does anyone step forth? Because one did survive the wreck. It so happened that after the Parsee's disappearance, I took the place as Ahab's oarsman, and when tossed aside, I fell astern. The scene was in full sight of me, but though drawn to the vortex, it was yet a creamy pool when I closed in. Round and round I did then revolve, till gaining the black center, the bubble upward burst, and owing to its great buoyancy, Queequeg's coffin-like boy shot lengthwise from the sea and floated by my side. Buoyed up by that coffin, for almost one whole day and night, I floated on a soft and dirge-like mane. The unharming sharks, they glided by as if with padlocks on their mouths. The savage seahawks sailed with sheathed beaks. On the second day, a sail drew near, nearer, and picked me up at last. It was the devious cruising Rachel that in her retracing search after her missing children only found another orphan.